Okay guys, so I'm doing kind of a remote intro to this video. Um, I'm not real fond of those, but it's pretty much all I got right now. So this is Laurie of Laurie's Heirloom Sewing. Thank you for joining me. And this video actually starts with me opening up a package that I received from Amazon that I paid for. It's an item I ordered, but that's not the typical way that I start a video. And I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> so you wouldn't think, oh, she just jumps right in. Okay, so um, that's where that one begins. And then I'm going to try to piece it together through editing. So I ordered this. I paid for this. I believe I am correct. I've never used this particular brand before. I don't know if you have, but I kind of wanted to see it. This right here being sewable, meaning that you can use spray this and then use your, your sewing machine is very important to me. Um, will not gum up the needles. So again, very good. Uh, temporary bond, excellent. Acid free is very important when you're working with textiles um, and including paper. And I have used basting adhesive on paper before. Uh, wrapping a gift um, with paper. It worked beautifully for Christmas last year. We had to wrap uh, our daughter's western saddle and it was in a massively huge box and I didn't have enough tape 505 is what I ended up using and it and I always generally wrap my presents way before the day that we open and it sat there completely wrapped up <laughs> the papers didn't fall off uh, it was great so if you're having a pinch that that was wonderful Okay, so it tells you to spray, press, and sew, and that's pretty much what I do with 505. So we're going to give this one a try. Okay, so these are some of the leftover charms I have. All right, I don't want to spray this on my sewing machine, so I'll hold this up to kind of keep it. All right, right out the gate, I can see that it's a lot thicker coming out of the spray can. We're going to see just what that bond is like. Alright, so ooh, it feels quite um, strong. We'll see how easy or difficult it is. It, I think it has a little bit more um, grab than does 505 but kind of cool I do want to kind of go over basic how to how to sew just you found a sewing machine your mom gave you a sewing machine your grandma gave you a sewing machine you bought a sewing machine and now you have it and it's like probably like me with my instant pot I've never used it. I'm terrified of it. I feel that there might be somebody out there who has the same sort of got the sewing machine and I've always kind of wanted to learn how to use it, but ah, and if that's the case, I sure hope I can help. I've been sewing since I was nine. <clears throat> and by sewing, I mean on a sewing machine. I started sewing um, things together with a needle and thread way before then. I would go visit my grandmothers. I've already told this story, but they they would hand me, you know, little pieces of fabric and a sewing needle and let me sew as a little girl. So I feel like it's just second nature to me. It sits up there with breathing. And I would love to share my love of sewing with you and hopefully that will become a passion that you will enjoy as well. 
one thing I do every time I sit down, and I don't always film this, but before I turn on the camera or before I start to do any sewing whatsoever, I go ahead and kind of give my sewing machine a looking over. It's very important to me. It's like my car. I don't want anything to happen to my sewing machine. It's not like I can go to the grocery store and pick up another box of sewing machine. It doesn't work that way. At least not in my house, it doesn't. So I try to keep George, this is George, I try to keep George clean and free of lint and dust it off. Um, now I will tell you, I probably should put a cover on George, but because I'm in here every single day, every day, um, unless I'm going out of town, um, I don't really, I feel like I'm, I'm better off just not covering George up with a, a cover. There, there are some that you can purchase that you can use. They're plastic and they just slip off, you know, they, it's just like putting a, pl a plastic bag over the top of your sewing machine. Just put it down and, and then it's covered up from dust. There are hard cases that you can purchase that are kind of universal. They'll fit just about any sewing machine. The thing about putting them in a case like that is, is I find once they're out of sight and in that case, it's kind of hard to get motivated to pick the case up, take the sewing machine out, set it up. This for me works so much better because I know all I have to do is come in, sit down, and get George cleaned up and start sewing. I don't have to open a box and do any of that other stuff. If keeping your sewing machine in a in a click case, as I call them, is really good for you. If that works for you, then by all means, absolutely do it. I'm going to drop the feed dogs. I don't know if you could see that. I will put them back up and zoom you in so that you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, there we go. So these are the feed dogs right here. They're these rough, two, basically two channels. They fill the two empty channels. I don't know how else to say it. They are above the throat plate, or some people call this the table. But if I want to take this metal plate off to clean the area that I need to clean right here, I have to drop the feed dogs or this table will not come off. So there's a little twisty button on the side of my sewing machine and when I twist it, those feed dogs will drop like that. So now all I have to do is lift up and then just push to the back and this is the plate. Now I don't know if you can see but there is a massive blob of lint and don't forget I did this yesterday before I started sewing. It doesn't matter what I'm sewing with cotton, linen, silk, sometimes a cotton polyester blend. It does not matter. I end up with this at the end of, let me back you up a little bit, at the end of every sewing day and that's just one blob of fabric lint right there. It's just everywhere. So what I do is I take, I have a series of paint brushes. They're soft bristles and they run in sizes from this being the smallest to this being the largest ish. The other one that I have is shorter bristles 
but it's extremely soft. It's like a makeup brush, but it's not. It's a paintbrush, Princeton Art and Brush Company. It is a wash brush, three-quarter inch, and it's super soft. You could actually use this as a makeup brush. And then this one is just the Santa Fe Art Supply, and I think in a weird way it's also a wash brush, but while this one looks more like a bright, um, I think it may also be used as a wash. So anyway, these are the three brushes that I typically use to clean out this area. Now, I'm not going to go into that. There, Just know that there should be nothing. Look at this. From yesterday. But anyway, what I was going to say is there should be nothing around your feed dogs. So if you see something that looks like a felt pad, it is not supposed to be there. That is just compacted lint. So you need to pull that out carefully. Um, I recommend that you turn off your sewing machine. Mine's on because I need the light. There's always a reason why people say, do as I say, not as I do. I realize that. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to say is, why, why can't I just use canned air? Well, here's my take on canned air. You can. However, there's a couple of things you need to know about using canned air. One is... Don't use canned air until after you have done what I'm doing. Otherwise, you're likely going to force a lot of lint into this, this area right here. You're just going to take that canned air and spray, and it's just going to push all that lint right into all those little cracks and crevices. And you'll never see it. You'll never know it's there until your sewing machine literally won't run, and you have to take it and get it cleaned out, and, and then they're, you know, the service person is thinking, wow, canned air much? So... That's my, my take on that. Now the other thing about canned air is it does serve a purpose and it will help you. However, I'm going to show you how I use it after I get all this lint picked up and thrown away. So I'm going to pull the bobbin case out. I have the case and the bobbin in one piece there. And then I'm just going to take a piece of paper like this, this pattern. It's guarding this area, and it's guarding this area up here. Okay. What I want to do is I want to kind of tip my sewing machine back like this. Sort of. And then just kind of from a good distance. I mean, I'm about 12 inches away. Just do that. Just a couple little short, quick bursts of air up in this area up here. The reason I covered this up is I don't want that lint to come, you know, drifting down and then drift right back into this area. Okay, now this little guy right here is the one that we were using to pull. If I, if I have a big ball of lint and I just touch it with this, these little bristles will just pull it. Like, you know, I just do this and it will pull the lint right out of my machine and I don't have to worry. I don't have to try to scoop it out. I'm just touching and touching. See, I just got another little blob right there. That's the best way to get the lint out of your machine is to just kind of touch those areas in the back that you really cannot get to. And you'll get little bits of lint here and there. Okay. 
Now I am going to look over things pretty, pretty carefully. Make sure that this is clean and these are still in place and nothing is broken. All right, the feed are still, the feed dogs are still down, so I should be able to put my sewing machine back together. All right, so from back here, I'm going to clip into place. Okay, just like that. And then I'm going to put this feed dog lever on the side of my machine. I'm going to turn it back to the proper place. And then I'm going to do one. I can either use my foot on the foot pedal or I can use my hand on the side flywheel. Let me back you up so you know what I'm talking about. This big dial right here. This dial only comes forward. I don't twist it back and forth. It will make the needle move up and down if I do that, but it's very, very hard on your sewing machine. Um, it's very damaging. All right, now I'm going to put the bobbin case with the bobbin in it back into the hook area. It's clipped into place. And I'm going to turn the flywheel only forward one revolution, pull my thread up, catch it on something so I can pull it all the way through. I need to get that bobbin thread up. And now as you can see, maybe, maybe, the feed dogs have come back up and they're going to stay there. I'm going to use something to just take a few stitches. Now I'm not using this area on this that I've drawn here. I'm only going to be stitching la, 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 around this leaf. So this right here is available to me as a scrap. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and take a few stitches. There's the needle thread. It looks pretty good. And here's the bobbin thread. And I think you can see it. I discovered in fine print several times transmitting was absolutely prohibited. So today's video is going to be basically how to sew. How to sew from cleaning the sewing machine to using a pattern, how to read a pattern, and, and what you need to do in order to get started if you've never sewn or if you've only sewn a couple of times and you've been frustrated. It, it will serve you well if you keep this area a good sharp non burred needle in it and you keep this area clean lint gets all in your sewing machine thread will cause lint and fabric will cause lint and it can also re lint that sounds really weird but you're sewing along, you've run out of bobbin thread, you open up your bobbin area, you pull this out, you're putting in the new bobbin thread, and then you put in the bobbin case, and you're ready to go. In the meantime, all the lint that was up here has now migrated down to this area. So you're just adding more lint. I just cleaned George and I think I got that on video. If I did, I will put that at the beginning of this video and you can see pretty much how I 
take care of George on a daily basis. I do a thorough cleaning about once a month, and I am not ready for that yet. But um, I'll try to get that in the beginning part of this video. So if you saw that prior to this, we're all good. Okay, I have decided that I'm going to use a um, fun little crafty kind of project uh, to explain sewing so that there's a lot not like this I can't wear that why did she choose a pattern that's too big for me why did she choose a pattern that's too small for me I can't stand wearing t-shirts I don't like button-up shirts we're gonna do something for a pet and if you don't have a pet you might know someone who does and if you don't know anyone who has a pet there are um, plenty of shelters uh, veterinary clinics they they all appreciate little little gifts like this for the animals that are there in their care so um, if you're not interested in sewing for an animal the ideas behind how to sew are still relevant so that's why I chose to use a animal pattern we also happen to have two smallish dogs. I can go ahead and just make it and then use it. It's getting it's October and they both go on very long walks in the afternoon and it's starting to get to that time of year where, you know, they could get cold. It is simplicity number 1239. It is a size small through large. Now that any time, even if you're looking at a um, clothing for human pattern, when you have an ambiguous um, size range like that, just be aware that there's more information on the back of this envelope. So don't let that throw you. So these are all the views. Now, there's something to keep in mind about the views. Anytime you see something that has been made, so for example, this pattern has a photograph and a photograph. These two items were made using this pattern that came in this envelope following the instructions to the letter. So if like me, you have a tendency to color outside the lines, you need to kind of keep that in mind if you're thinking to yourself that is gosh that's so cute that is adorable why are you thinking that are you thinking it because it's pink and black if the color is the reason you need to remember you might not be able to find that particular fabric if it's the style well there you go that will be within this pattern envelope but it will also have all of the elements that are going to go into sewing that view. So view E has a hood, it has a scarf, and it has the body of our little jacket. If you don't want to make the hood, even though you think to yourself, huh, that's so cute. Well, there are several other options that you can make like for example B is basically this without the scarf and the hood this one right here is a drawing of this one right here so of course this right here is the actual real version of this up here but you could make this orange and black and have sort of a cute little wear it over the hot you know Halloween holiday um, color will change the way they look as will the style if you don't put the hood or the collar this one has a collar and no hood this one has a little pocket and no hood this one has a little collar and a little bow no hood so also, particularly with an animal pattern, 
you know, make sure that your animal, your dog, your cat, whatever you're choosing to make this for, will wear it. So when I turn this over, there's a lot of information on the back of this. I have the guide drawings. And basically what a guide drawing does is it gives you the details that you might not see, especially in a sewn version. So if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, that's just adorable, and then you turn it over, okay, it's view E, and you look at view E, and you didn't know that it had a pocket on the back, or it had a Velcro closure in the front, or just whatever. There was some element of this particular pattern that you weren't aware of because it was hard to see in the sewn up version. Well, this gives you all of that information. So you have the hood, you have the coat, and you have the scarf. So if you're looking at view C and D, here is where you're going to find the information about C coat or D coat. But before you look at those, you need to look up here. This is what it's going to tell you. Dog coats in three sizes. Well, small through large. How do I determine this? Where do I get this information? What is my dog? Is my dog small, medium, medium large, small, medium? I mean, it's hard to know, right? Except that they will give you these body measurements. So look for the word sizes and you'll see the S, the M, and the L. And then above it, it's gonna give you body measurements. So for the dogs, you're going to need a neck circumference, mid-body girth, that's around, back length, and that's gonna go from the back of where their collar sits, back here, to where their tail begins or where you want this jacket to end. And that's a whole different discussion that we'll get into in just a minute. And then the collar to mid belly. So you'll go underneath their neck here and underneath the, the body of the dog to mid belly. And again, that's also very important. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now we're going to talk about fabric. Up here at the top it's going to give you an idea of what types of fabric will work really well for everything you see here. So for coat A you could do it in a double faced pre-quilted fabric. Now here's the cool thing about that. You can make a double faced pre-quilted fabric you don't need to go purchase it. If you have something at home that you like or you want to recycle, all you have to do is put a piece of fabric down, face down, so that the pretty side is on your table. On top of that, put some batting, quilt batting, and then on top of that, put another piece of fabric pretty side up. So you basically have the wrong side of the fabric face up on the bottom, a piece of quilt batting on top of that, and the wrong side of the fabric touching the quilt batting on the top. And then you just take it to your sewing machine or you sit down with a quilting hoop and you quilt it. And you make yourself a piece of quilted fabric that will fit for your dog. Or you can purchase it. They do have it. Um, so then for View B, C, and D, and E, you can make it out of chino, which is like a heavy cotton, corduroy, cotton types like denim, flannel, gabardine, tweed, twill, or wool. You can also use fleece, which is what I'm going to be using today. You need to measure to get where your dog 
falls. So if it's in the 9 to 11 neck circumference, it's a small, 12 to 14 medium, 15 to 18 large. And then you'll take these other measurements, so it'd be back length and collar to mid belly. Looking at the instructions for C and D, it tells me that I'm going to be using 45 inch wide fabric. And then I'm going to come straight down here. So small, I need 5 eighths of a yard of fabric, 3 quarter of a yard of fabric, or 7 eighths of a yard of fabric. And then for the contrast, the pieces of the coat that aren't the same as the fabric, so that'd be the collar, the tab, and the bow, I'm going to need the same thing. I need 5 eighths, 3 fourths, or 7 eighths of a yard for the contrast coat, collar, tab, and bow. I'm not making the bow, so I don't need to worry about cutting that particular piece out. And then for the notions, and the notions are all the other things, like buttons and... Alright guys, so I was pulled away and I'm trying to remember where I was. I think we were talking about the notions. We've already gone over fabric, we've already gone over the sizing and how to measure neck circumference, and that would be like the collar size of your dog. Uh, Mid-body girth is basically about right here. This would be mid-body girth right there. Um, their back length is from the back of their collar to where you want the finished little jacket to sit. And the collar to mid-belly is underneath their chin, through their front legs, and to the center of their little body back there. Okay, so the notions that I'm going to need, because I'm doing C and D, or C, D combo, are four inch length of one inch hook and loop tape, that's Velcro, um, and two seven eighths of an inch buttons, that's for C. For D, it's four inches of a one inch hook and loop tape, three one and a quarter inch buttons, and one sequin bow applique. So that's this little thing right here. Nope, that's this one right here. So the applique is hard to see. It's on the collar right there, right in front of my fingernail. And in the drawing, it shows up right there. So that right there, okay? And then um, this particular version does not require any trim, so I'm good with that. And I'm looking at the back of this because I wanna see if there's anything else on this that I need any other information on the front or on the back. And to my knowledge, I've looked at down in here underneath this flap, it talks about with nap, without nap, and with or without nap. That's the key. So without nap is one asterisk, with nap is two, and with or without is three. And that will be based on the fabric that you are looking like if it's 45 inches wide it's still the same thing you're still going to need the exact same amount whether it has a nap or not okay nap nap is the way a fabric looks when you run your hand over it one way and then when you turn around and run your hand over it the other way you will see a difference in the shading that's nap most print cottons do not have a nap. Some fleeces will have a nap. And you treat nap the exact same way that you would treat a one-way design. So if you have a fabric that is not a um, scattered design or a tossed design, but everything is either going up or everything is going down, that's considered a one-way design and you have to pay attention to that if you want your 
pattern or your finished product to have a uniform look. Sometimes it's more fun to not worry about it, but for the most part, we do want to try to make an effort to have our fabrics going in the direction that they should be going. Okay, so after you've done all of that and it's time to get to the pattern, what you're going to find is, and I'm, I've already cut this out, so I'm just going to show you, you will have pieces of pattern paper that are printed in this case with various sizes. So there's a small complete set, a medium complete set, and a large complete set. This happens to be the complete medium set. So I have the medium hood, the medium scarf, the medium pocket, medium um, hood center and hood band. Every single thing on this particular sheet was for size medium. And then there's one specific for small and one specific for large. And I apologize for all the crinkly crackling. That's one thing about pattern paper that everybody knows. It's very crinkly. Okay. So you, you've come to that part where you're going to cut out your the pattern pieces that you need. Or have you? Not yet. What you need to do is get into the instructions. And we'll talk about these a little. Almost every single pattern from the big three or big four, depending on who you count in big three and big four, will have pattern instructions that look like this. So you open it up and you'll see this piece right here. And it's going to tell you that it's Simplicity 1239 and what it makes. Now often, people who are sewing all the time will take either an air erase pen or a heat erase pen and they will circle the view that they are making. I'm making view D so I can come down here right into this. It's going to give me all of the pieces and this is for every single size. So size small, size medium, and size large will all have the same number of pieces. Piece, there's 12 pieces per size. Now for the view that I'm making, I'm going to need piece number four. I am going to need piece number five, piece number, piece number one I need, piece number th four I need, and piece number five I need. Yeah, okay. Then I look at my cutting layout. A cutting layout is how you lay your fabric down and then how you put the pattern pieces onto the fabric in order to cut them out. That's what the cutting layout means. You also will have pattern printed side down. So that's what that looks like. Pattern printed side up. That's what that looks like. This tells you what to do before during and after you've cut out your fabric and then um, here are your layouts so coat A, coat B, C, and D so that's I need this one so I'm going to put a check mark right there and then coat C contrast coat collar tab and bow I don't need that but the contrast collar and tab I need so I'm going to put a check mark there. So these are the two. I know that I need to fold my fabric and then cut out the actual coat. And it'll be cut on the fold so that when that opens out, it will be the full coat, not just half of the coat. And then for the contrast collar and tab, same thing. I need two pieces for the collar and two pieces for the tab. So I'll cut those two pieces out in the direction and the way they tell me to do it. And then it's going to give me some 
how to sew the way that this all goes together generally speaking it's going to give me special sewing directions in the beginning which is what it's doing it's telling me how to finish off with braid how to finish off a curve with some bias trim it's going to tell me how to finish off the ends of the the trim and the and the braid um, how to add piping how to taper the ends when I'm doing piping and uh, how to join up those two ends when I've got fabric covered cord okay Now I'm going to start on page two of four, and this is coat A. I'm not making coat A, so I do not need to look at this whole section right here. I'm going to flip it over. Now I'm getting into coats B, C, D, and E. So I have my coat number one cut out. This is where the neck goes. The dog's head would be right here. And this is the back of the coat right there. And then for view B, it tells you you've got to make that football lacing. So it tells you how to do that. I'm not doing it. So I'm going to skip down to collar C and D. Okay, I'm doing collar D without a bow on it. So. With right sides together, I'm going to stitch those collar pieces together, leaving the notched edges open, trim, and clip. And we're going to get into all that as we go. It gives you an illustration. It tells you where your seam allowances are. And then you turn over to page 3, and it tells you how to put the tab on and um, how to make the little bow, which I'm not going to be making. Here's the sequins bow, which we're not going to do. And then we're going to stitch a button over the top of the Velcro closing. So that's just to kind of give it a cute finished look. And then we go on to the hood and the scarf. And we're going to move on. Oop. Here's the hood. Here's the band. And here's the scarf. So anything that we need to do could be scattered throughout this set of directions. Pocket and piping for view E are back here, and then continue as follows for views B, C, D, and E. Well, we fall into that category. So evidently, we're going to stitch with right sides together. We're going to stitch all the way around, leaving an opening, and then we're going to flip that out press out those corners, and then we're going to finish this off. Um, it tells us that we're going to need hook and eye. So we've got that there, and that there, and that there, and that there. So this goes under the belly of the dog, and this goes around the head and the neck of the dog. Okay. And that looks pretty good, and then we're done. So, now we're ready to look at these pattern pieces. So we have kind of done a rough cut. Now I only use pattern, or excuse me, I only use paper scissors. I do not like to use my fabric scissors on paper. But when I get these rough cut out, then I'll just kind of go back and trim as close to the black line as I can. Now for the most part, you need to cut out your pattern pieces right on the black line. If you find that difficult to do when it is just paper, then go ahead and wait and cut that out when it's attached to the fabric. Sometimes having that extra bulk makes it so much easier. There's like three different ways, three different methods for cutting out some people like and live in the pinking shear uh, camp. Some prefer straight scissors. And 
Then the third would be those who love to cut things out with their rotary cutter. I am unfortunately dealing with a very dull rotary cutter. I, I don't have a blade that would cut hot butter. So I use my 8 inch um, fabric scissors. They are rather short for me. I would rather have a 10 inch pair of fabric scissors. I feel like, or, um, you know, dressmaker shears because you get a lot more cut um, when you have a longer pair of scissors. It's more efficient, I suppose I'll sh I should say. Um, eight inch is fine. It's just you don't get that efficiency. So, I'm just going to do a quick cleanup of the pattern. The next thing I want to do is mark the seam allowance. Markers are great for that because they tend to actually, you know, show up better than this chalk is. This is a chalk pencil. And I'm just making a big mess. But if you take a marker and you mark along that seam allowance, it helps you keep your eye focused on that when you're cutting out your pattern and that will add to the accuracy. So if you've got a completely different color line to focus on as you're cutting out, you will notice that, that you're going to have a very different outcome. It will be a better outcome. For some reason this kind of helps to steady us having a different color, you know, line there. So we're going to start with the line that I was just outlining. The dashed line is your seam allowance. So it's, it's the allowed amount that you can use to stitch. I've got to have, I'll just use this. This is a permanent marker and you may not want to use a permanent marker, but I don't mind. It won't bother me. So another thing that we need to do here is we need to mark where the notches are. Now if you just draw a straight line, so you've got the V and you know there's a notch there, so just draw a straight line, but make sure that you're only drawing a line on the notch that of the view that you are using because it can throw you off. You don't want to do that. So view C and D, there's a notch right there at the neck. Okay, this is the fold and it's the fold for every single view. So our fabric would be folded under, this is on top, and when we cut this out we unfold it and we have two neck edges and two underbelly flaps. Okay, so view C, D, and E are all going to get this circle right here as a pivot mark on the jacket. So I'm going to go ahead and just circle it so I don't lose it. I know where it is. Okay, up here we have view C and D. And again, I'm just going to circle this because I don't want to lose that. I need to remember that. This is not marked as anything. So I'm going to circle it because I think we need it. Now, if I were if I had a marker, I'd be using red or yellow, something that's really going to stand out. The blue isn't so much. This information right here is very important. It tells you it's the front and the back for all of the views. It tells you that you're going to cut one on the fold and that you're going to cut one on the fold of contrast fabric for view B, C, D, and E. Okay? 
So I know I need contrast fabric and I know I need my outer fabric. Then it has the placement line for the trim for view B and all of those little dashed lines right there would also be a trim for view B. And then this is also a placement line for trim for view B. And this is the flap line for view A. We don't need that for our jacket. So there we go. And again, this one here is not marked as specific for any of the views. So it applies to all of the views. And that would be that Velcro piece that goes under the, the dog's stomach. Okay, what do we have here? So this is the tab. We're going to cut out two. We have marks here and here. And then this is our seam allowance right here. The dotted line is the seam allowance. And just, you know, if you had a marker, just mark that. Okay, one of the notions that I use often is transparent tape. It is a wonderful way to strengthen areas of stress on a pattern. So I have a small piece of tape right here. It is an inch. I'm going to take my paper scissors and cut it in half. I just find it easier to do it this way because if I try to break off a half an inch I end up not being able to and it's just too aggravating. So I'm now going to put one piece of this tape on this side of this drill hole right here. And I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to put this one on the other side like that. And I'm going to do the same thing to this one here. And the reason that I put tape on both sides of these little circles is because if I even if I only mark this once, it will still help in the process of degrading this pattern. And I don't want this pattern to fall apart. I want it to stay sharp and useful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this in half, like so. I'm going to take a small pair of rounded tip scissors, and I'm just going to cut like so. I'm going to do the same thing on this one. When I get to the part where I need to mark this, these two circles on my fabric, the tip of my marking pen will go right through that little slash mark that I made. There it is right there, there it is right there, and I can see it. Now if I need to use something that I that this you know is bigger than this, I can also cut it out because now it's strong enough it can withstand being cut. So that's one one reason that I use masking tape or not masking tape, clear transparent tape. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and if I have a tear like right here, I will repair that. Oh, and this piece I'm going to fold over. So I'm going to put this on top of that notch and I'm going to fold it over like so. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other notch. Okay, I have a circle here at the intersection of my seam allowances. I'm going to go ahead and put a piece of tape there and I'll have one on the other side as well. And then I'm just going to cut out. I need one for the back of the one that I just did. And honestly the pieces of tape don't have to be very big. I think you can see that. They can be just teeny tiny pieces of tape. So it's not like you're going to go through huge amounts of tape 
taking care of your you know 12 to 15 dollar pattern now when I have a tiny little hole like this one here or a circle I use my seam ripper I'm gonna put it on top of this sewing machine mat and I'm just gonna poke several holes in that circle why did she tape the notches well there are several different ways to, to mark a notch. Some people like to do the opposite. So you've got your fabric underneath the pattern piece like this, and you're going along with your scissors and you're cutting and you're cutting and you're cutting, and then you cut out a little notch like this, out like that and then you cut and then you cut out. That doesn't work for everyone and often those little sticky outy notches can get kind of cumbersome especially when you're doing a center back. If you're doing a center back or a center front on a collar or a shirt or a jacket there's not a whole lot of room between these two notches to, to hit that center mark they don't get cut out correctly because you're cutting with your scissors and you come up here and you cut this one out and it's perfect and then you take your scissors and you try to cut cut and before you get there you're already aiming out and you cut and your notch is really here or it's really over there somehow now the center of your collar is really you know a quarter of an inch up but it's not gonna match on the garment because there's only one notch to cut out here so you can do that one beautifully but this center line right here is not going to match up with the center line on your collar because you didn't get this notch cut out correctly so the way I do notches this is my fabric so I'm gonna take my friction ink and I'm going to draw a line. I'm going from the center of the notch up and out like that. Just like that. Now I've cut out my fabric. All I have to do, I've got, I'm here, I'm cutting, I'm cutting with my scissors. I get to here. I'm just going to take my friction ink pen and extend this line like this and then cut 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 this will be cut away right here but my fabric is marked I have a lot of little tapey areas <clears throat> this one is where the piece of velcro is going to go And I'm just going to fold it in half. Oh, goodness me. Oh, I need a cameraman. All right. So I'm just going to fold it in half. I put a piece of tape here and a piece of tape on the back. I'm going to fold my circle in half and snip. And if I want to, I can snip again. I know I can get my friction ink pen in there, so that's not really an issue. Okay, so coming around here, I've got another little square right there, and make a hole with my seam ripper. When I'm done doing this, I want it to resemble a salt shaker, and then it just kind of opens up, and I can easily get my pen through there. Okay, now I have the um, notch. Now the nice thing is I know that these notches are not going to fall apart on me. They're going to stay nice and crisp as long as I have this pattern. Okay, I'm looking for this right here. This is the little tab that goes on the back of the jacket. And it will get a mark because I want one side to be even with the other side. and just give it a little cut 
the pin will go through there and that's perfect. And then for the other side of the Velcro that goes under the belly, same thing, if you can tell. All right, so all of the, p the parts of this pattern that I feel strongly need to be reinforced have been reinforced. Okay. So the next part will be to put them on top of the fabric and cut it out. So I need to clear off my sewing table, which is an absolute... I'm going to show you how bad it is. I've been just busy throwing things on it, throwing things on it, throwing things on it, and focusing on this area. So hang on. Here we go. decided I was going to use one of these as a liner. It's a cotton fabric. It's bright. It's easy to see. Um, it's memorable. And that's what you want with a dog. If your dog is um, ever lost, if you've got his little coat on him or her, it's so easy to say, jacket, that I made out of leaf fabric that looks like camo, but the inside is lined with red and white stars. That is so easy to see, so easy to find, so easy to identify, and it's easy for you to remember, right? So um, I also recommend, just as an aside, I've been around animals my whole entire life, you leave your house to take your dog on a walk. We all have a cell phone now. When you're walking out the door with your dog, ready to go that day, take a picture of your dog that day. You can erase it when you get home. If you don't want to clog up your phone with a bunch of pictures, that's fine. But at least you'll have access. You lose your dog. You need somebody to help you. You just open up your phone. Boom, there it is. There's my dog right now. I took that picture when we were walking out of the house. And you won't have to search around in your phone thinking, oh my God, when was the last time I took a picture of my dog? I just went into the room where Harley, our little dude, is resting, and I took his measurements. These are fabric weights that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Oh, that's heavy. All right. So, now we need our layout. And if we... Look at our layout. We need to remember that we have to have our fabric folded in half to get one piece one, right? Here's the layout. And I'm using um, some cabbage, just leftover scrap fabric that I had from making a pair of pants for my sister out of this lovely, glorious, wonderfully warm fleece. So what I need to look at is when I'm looking at this, it's going to tell me that printed side up, the pattern printed side up, well that's printed side up because this is um, what I'm seeing here and if printed side up, that means the part that has printing on it. And then, yep, that's just oh, barely enough. All right, so now what I do, I made these weights using copper BBs and 
um, polyfill. They're very heavy. I did not want to use a food product like rice or uh, walnut shells. I wanted something heavy and something that animals, mice, insects would not be attracted to. Those were my rules. So for the most part you can use uh, just one right in the middle like so. I'll talk to you about that. So the thing I need to make sure of is that the grain line this direction so vertically to me so from me moving outward and horizontally to me so sweeping across the front of my body like this so horizontally and vertically would be the grain lines on this fabric. Anything at an angle is a bias. Most people are aware of a 45 degree bias. We don't want a bias cut on this jacket. Okay, so my what I need to do is just spread, put a weight right in the middle, and you can you know do two or three if you feel like yours are not heavy enough. And they're going to kind of keep your your pattern sitting on your fabric and then just spread out the pattern like so away from the weights like this you can adjust it as you need to do keep in mind that the weight of the pattern weights can cause the pattern to tear but just spread out that weight going vertically and horizontally and then pin I recommend especially on fleece that you use very long pins like this and try to pin close to but not on the cutting line and I don't like to destroy my seam allowance so I'm just on the inside of the seam allowance. A lot of people that I know only put pins in this way. And that works well too. It does hold things equally as well as this to me. Now I'm also going to supplement my pins with some weights. And you are beautifully set up to cut out with your rotary cutter. My rotary cutter won't cut hot butter, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to use my scissors, but I'm going to make it easy on myself. And rough cut that away. So that is good. Now when I open this out, it's all one piece, if you can visualize that. We're going to cut out the other few pieces, then we're going to mark, and then we're going to cut out the lining. So we have our tab. just going to stitch. I will show you where I'll leave an opening. I'll just clip it. So I'm not going to stitch all the way to there or all the way to there. So I'll start here and I'll go stitch, 
stop. Then I'll flip it inside out, and when I come back, you'll be able to see that. There it is. I'm just going to turn this to the right side. And like I said earlier, I want this to be a color that's a standout so that if I need to find my dog, I can find my dog. Which, you know, that makes the jacket unique. Anytime you make anything, you have that option. Okay, so then we're going to just stitch this closed. We will give this a press. And then find a couple of buttons, one for each end, here and here. And then that will go on the back of the jacket. Now, uh, when I fold up my pattern pieces, everybody knows I always fold them so that I can see the number. Now with this particular pattern, every single size has the same number. So there's 12 pattern pieces per size and they are all numbered the same. So one small is the same as one medium and one large same pattern piece, which is the jacket in this case. Okay, I'm just going to show you that. Okay, so now all of these are marked and I can remove these pins. Okay. <clears throat> now, you might be wondering, won't this be just a little bit too big since we aren't going to be turning it inside out Oops, and there won't be a uh, piece to take up the seam allowance. Yes, it will be slightly bigger. So in order to fix how, in order to fix that, oh, I'm going to go all the way around. And I'm going to trim the seam allowance down don't need it it's too much fabric for Harley and I can see without the pattern on here okay one two three four five so there's about five eighths Okay, now Harley is a pug, and he has kind of a, a thick neck, so this can be trimmed, this neck edge can be trimmed a little bit, which I, I did take a little extra there. All the way around. Okay, so I'm going to put my machine, oh, put my machine back in a straight stitch. I'm going to stitch around the outside of the tab. Okay, and I will look for two little pin, uh, buttons. Now, stitch this on by hand. All right, so there's the tab. And in case you didn't notice, I did find the Velcro, or I can't say Velcro because it isn't Velcro. It's hook and loop, and it's from a company. I bought that. Whoa, guys, it was eons ago. right on the front. Let's see, how many inches is this? Or how many inch? Okay, it ends up being two. Now, I really don't want to use my fabric scissors on this. All right, so now you have two pieces. One is hook, one is loop. The fuzzy is loop, the stiff is hook. 
okay? So imagine that you're putting this on your dog, sort of right in the middle, like this. And I'm just going to go stitch, 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 stitch. That's kind of the way that works. Need to make sure I'm in a straight stitch, needle down. see if it works. So here we go. This is the neck edge opening. This is where it's attached by Velcro. It is an extremely tight Velcro. I will not lie to you about that. Okay. So there's that. Now the only other piece is this one that goes around his little belly the hook piece and I don't want this to rub on his tummy so I'm going to round off and round off so I want to make sure that it will be completely covered up by the other piece because I do not want velcro rubbing on his tummy. I feel like that's too, that's literally too much. It just needs to be kind of a button size. So I've cut it down. Okay. And one of these days, when he's wearing it, I'll have him model it. But what I was talking about as far as the adjustability goes, if you need to make it tighter across the belly, or looser for that matter, you can just barely touch the two pieces together or you can go all the way over until you're off of the um, hook side and that makes it you know totally adjustable um, just make sure that whatever you do you don't have a, the hook and loop tape against your dog's skin it can be very irritating and cause problems that you don't want. And they are warm and cozy and a little snazzy in their little jacket. I'll go see if I can get a picture of, of Mr. Harley wearing it. We will see. I'll be right back. So there we go. I think he looked very handsome. Not too bad. That's Bama with his, or Harley with his brother Bam Bam. <laughs> and there he is saying, no, I will not look. So anyway, it turned out nice. He's comfortable. He's wearing it. I know I need to make some more face masks. I'm, I'm literally at, um, like one right now. So I think I'll make up a few out of these fabrics.
what I'm going to do now is finish up making a few more masks and um, Harley left to go on his walk so um, I will report back in the next video about whether or not he is digging the little jacket sometimes dogs don't and Harley you know he can be rather opinionated so of course Bam Bam's feelings were hurt because he didn't get one but Bam Bam has a very water resistant coat and he tends to revel in cold weather he loves snow I don't know that he really needs a coat I'm at the very end of the day after that whole video was created and spent most of the day editing the weather was a little rough today and that kind of bothers Bam Bam my little rescue dog and I ended up spending a lot of time today kind of comforting him so I don't know if I'm gonna have time today to do another video I really want to I have to get in that sewing room I have something to open and I might have a small quick project but you know me I, I gotta sew I, I just have to every day I have to sew something so knowing what I have in there and how much I'm kind of on limited time I it'll be quick or I'll just have to add to it can you see this is basically this is the the day that we've been dealing with that's outside in my front right outside my my window here <laughs> it's been like that almost all day super windy kind of cold the uh, yeah well, I'm not gonna do a weather report but in any case anyway I just wanted to say thank you guys for watching I had a lot of fun making the little jacket for Harley and by the way he has worn it several times so my point in all this is just to say I hope everybody has a wonderful Tuesday evening and I appreciate you being here um, it means a lot to me and um, I will see you in the next video bye